Okay. I know people are still gathering in, but I want to begin so we have more time for the discussion today. Thank you all again for joining us. We are um, kicking off today's event with a webinar uh, around manufacturing and industrial that is attached to our manufacturing and industrial deal connect to happen later on this afternoon. Uh, I want to thank our sponsors and of course our speakers for joining us. We will get to introducing them in a second. For those of you who I have yet to meet, my name is Lena Dobreer. I'm the Director of Operations at Opus Connect. We're a lower middle and middle market M&A focused organization. Uh, we are membership based and our members primarily consist of private equity firms, investment bankers, independent sponsors, et cetera. We do a number of events, a number of events uh, over the course of a year. I think we're doing closer to 300 now given the virtual nature of everything. Um, so if you're interested in learning a bit more about who we are, what we do, how we can help, please feel free to reach out to my colleague, uh, Swayze Yancey, his contact information is below, and he'll answer any questions that you have. Um, today we'll be taking live Q&A, so as questions pop up, which, there we go, perfect, uh, please submit them in the Q&A bubble. Let's try to avoid the chat as much as possible, we will not be monitoring that, so Please submit your questions in the Q&A bubble. Our moderator will be monitoring those um, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Now, these events, of course, would not be possible without the continued support of our sponsors. So we definitely wanna give them an opportunity to introduce themselves, one of which is moderating. And the other is David Kogan of Sapien Investigations. David, I see you here. Please go ahead and introduce yourself and your firm, please. Good morning, Lena. Yes, hi, this is David Kogan. I'm the Managing Director of Sapient Investigations. We're an international corporate intelligence firm and we are um, essentially an integrity company in the private equity space. We provide executive background checks on pretty much everybody in the, in the deal ecosystem from management teams, joint venture partners, um, we even work with uh, large lenders on, on large commercial loans. Um, we also have a, a very robust litigation and fraud uh, division and, and do a lot of kind of uh, troubleshooting, I guess you might call it. Anyway, it's always great to be at Opus. We've been working with Opus for 10 years. It's a fantastic group and I look forward to the, the webinar. Thank you, David. Thanks, Lena. Good to have you as always. Um, our next sponsor is Plant Moran, but of course, Craig Zampa is going to be uh, moderating today. So we'll wait until we introduce the panel and uh, for him to introduce himself. Before we get to the discussion, we have two poll questions that we'd like to ask of you. This will help us get an idea of who's in the audience, the first one. So I'm gonna go ahead and launch that first one. Please go ahead and submit your answers. We'll move through these fairly quickly. Are you an independent sponsor, investment banker, capital provider on the debt or equity side, service provider or other? Let us know and then we'll move on. Great. So 12% independent sponsor, 47% investment banker, 24% capital provider on the debt side, 6% on the equity side, 6% 6 service provider, and 6% other. Uh, thank you all for participating. That's helpful for us to know who we are addressing today. Uh, we have one more question that I would like to ask, and this is around in-person events. We've been hearing from a lot of you that you're ready to get back to it. So are you comfortable or are you not? Let us know. Um, this will help us get a, get a pulse on the network and then we'll move on to today's discussion. Okay. So 94% of you are ready, seven, 6%, excuse me are not. Uh, that's good to know. Thank you for letting us know. Uh, it's interesting to see how those answers have shifted over the last you know, 12, 14 months. Uh, but without, without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's moderator, 
Craig Zampa of Plant Moran. Craig, the floor is yours, please. Thank you so much, Lena, I really appreciate it. So as Lena mentioned, I'm Craig Zamp, I'm a partner at Plant Moran. Um, actually, I'm a partner that oversees our IT, M&A lifecycle services uh, at Plant Moran. So we serve PE and strategic buyer clients um, in my group of focused on their IT needs related to growing their investments all the way from pre-close and diligence activities on through uh, growth of the investments and portfolios uh, in advance of the closing um, activities, so or sale to the market. So I'm very fortunate and pleased to introduce uh, three panelists today. I'll actually let them introduce themselves, but maybe we could start with you, Jessica. Sure. Thanks, Craig. My name is Jessica Ginsberg, and I lead develop I lead business development for LFM Capital. LFM is a private equity firm based in Nashville, Tennessee, and we are focused on investing in manufacturing companies. We were founded by engineers and former operators who sort of grew up on the shop floor and bring a whole lot of um, energy and, and ideas to the companies that we partner with. So we, we look to um, really take our, take our portfolio companies to the next level. Um, one, one way we do that is through add-ons. So look forward to talking about that today. Thanks so much, Jessica. Uh, Michael Cohen, would you mind introducing yourself? Uh, good morning. This is Michael Cohen. Our firm is Impact Capital Group. We are a full service M&A advisory, lower middle market M&A advisory firm. We do a lot of valuation and advisory work on the M&A front. We do capital raises, 5 million and up. Uh, buy and sell side transactions in the 10 to $150 million size range or so. Most of those are in the say 10 to $60 million size range. And my background has been in uh, private equity. So I've been in the shoes of financial buyers and also I led mergers and acquisitions for Honeywell. So in the shoes of a st large strategic uh, buyer and seller. Looking forward. Thanks. Oh, thanks so much, Michael. Steven? Yeah, good, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, Steve Zellick, I'm with uh, Young America Capital. Um, we are a 70-person uh, uh, boutique investment banking firm based out of New York uh, that's focused on the uh, lower, lower emerging mid to middle markets, uh, providing uh, both capital raises as well as M&A advisory. Uh, we cover about uh, eight different sectors. I lead, I'm the sector lead for our industrials, chemicals, and manufacturing, which is uh, connected to this uh, this program today where we focus in on everything that's essentially made, distributed or serviced, but we cover everything from uh, uh, consumer retail, healthcare, uh, life sciences, uh, distribution, uh, FinTech, media, et cetera. Um, we, uh, we do that um, you know, across the country uh, and work with a number of uh, individuals and in, uh, in firms. Um, my background at similar to what Michael just indicated, was actually on the corporate side, uh, where I led corporate development for, uh, for Fortune uh, 500, 1000s uh, during the course of my career. Thank you so much, Stephen. So I wanna get into the, the meat and the materials of today so we can um, start picking the brains of our panelists and getting some really good insights from them. But today we'll be discussing add-ons and integration management with a focus on buyers in the middle market manufacturing industries. PE firms are estimated to own 25% of lower middle market privately held companies. So finding new platforms can be challenging. Many firms are adding value to their existing platforms through add-on acquisitions in addition to organic growth of the existing portfolios. Some add-on expansion strategies include expansion of customer footprint across regions not currently served by their portfolio company. An example of this could be a designer or installer and servicer of commercial security equipment needing a local presence to manage their expanded customer base. Another strategy could be increased control up or down the supply chain by purchasing existing distributors or suppliers. Uh, perhaps an example could be a furniture manufacturer who purchases their caster supplier. Further, there could be a broadening of customer channels through product expansion, uh, perhaps a salad dressing portfolio, expanding their product line by purchasing a hot sauce and seasoning CPG. 
Portfolio acquisitions always introduced a host of challenges, including potential need to identify more professional management, modernization of technology tools and business processes, and addressing regulatory compliance deficiencies. But add-on acquisitions bring a whole new host of challenges, like assimilating and reconciling employee headcount, or rationalizing technology, purchasing, accounting, and HR processes and tools for cost and operations efficiency. All this before the overall platform is brought to market for resale. So first, I just want again, want to thank the panel for joining today and sharing your time. And we'll be discussing advantages and challenges of add-ons, including how to value add-on acquisitions, considerations of how add-on acquisitions can be different, impacts and importance of assimilating add-ons, and challenges and lessons learned from previous experiences. As Lena shared earlier, please submit any questions you may have for the panel throughout the presentation, and I'll do my best to address them uh, or, or select them during the session and have the panelists address them. If you have a specific panelist in mind that you want to speak to it, then please go ahead and identify that in the Q&A as well. So why don't we go ahead and get started? I've got a handful of questions and I'm actually gonna start with Michael today. Michael, how do you value add-on acquisitions differently from other types of acquisitions? Yes, uh, uh, when you're doing an add-on for a portfolio company, you're really looking at it as a from through the eyes of a strategic buyer. And strategic buyers value companies and acquisitions very differently than private equity firms, both in terms of mindset and methodology. The mindset is different because when you're acquiring a, a platform investment, you're looking at the company standalone on an independent basis, and you're generally looking at focusing on historical results and using you know, multiples as a valuation methodology. On the other hand, when you're looking to do a strategic acquisition or an add-on in order to add value to your portfolio in that way, the mindset's completely different because you're looking at a combined operation, a combined entity that, would, that has synergies. So the methodology is very different. In, in fact, instead of using a backward looking, you know, focusing on historical results, you really need to focus on forward looking results and, and how the combined companies are gonna perform in the future. Since that's really what you're getting is the future performance. So, so the, the main tool that strategic acquirers use is DCF, which is forecast dependent, as you know. So. Uh, in order to do strategic acquisitions, you need to have very strong intelligence about the market opportunities and in order to uh, develop a, a forecast and revise the forecast that you get from target companies. Um, typically, the DCF analysis will include synergies, all the different types, types of synergies that Craig mentioned from revenues to marketing to distribution channels, SG&A, consolidations, operations. So all of these synergies are evaluated independently, kind of separately. Um, and in fact, uh, so each synergy could have a cost of realizing the synergies as well as the benefits. So you can actually calculate an ROI for each synergy or an NPV for each synergy. Um, <clears throat> typically, uh, you know, these NPVs are, are added together so you can get uh, a complete uh, view of the combined operations. So uh, a financial acquisition might provide one enterprise value, whereas a strategic synergistic valuation will result in a, typically a higher valuation, enterprise value. And the range is typically 10% more for things like revenue and uh, distribution synergies, maybe balance sheet synergies on up to say 50% more for an operational or consolidation type of uh, synergy. Of course, as Craig mentioned, in order to actually realize the synergies, the buyer needs to be completely committed to the development, uh, creation and management and implementation of an integration plan. You know, you really need to execute in order to realize synergy. So hope Perfect. that's helpful. Thank you so much, Michael. Appreciate that. Uh, Stephen, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, Michael gave a, uh, a rather complete answer there, and I would uh, 
I would concur with, uh, you know, pretty much everything he said. I think the things I would want to emphasize is that, um, you know, again, in coming from both uh, thinking about this from as, as a corporate previous in my previous career, as well as uh, as a banker advising companies that are uh, in PE firms and family offices that are out looking for uh, add-ons is yes, um, do your projections going forward, take a look at the synergies, keep track of them separately though, because I think the importance is you have to basically value the base business and that's your bid for that. And then determine which, what portion or percentage of the, the, the expected synergies on a DCF basis that you're willing to pay. Because obviously if you pay hundred percent, you're, you're not gonna generate any additional value uh, for your uh, for your enterprise and for your platform. Um, additionally, create that stage gated process to uh, to effectuate the uh, synergies, and then I know we'll probably touch upon this later in the uh, presentation. But as soon as you've completed the transaction, if you are successful, bring the uh, bring the incumbent management team in on the process that you've gone through, give them the uh, the the full rundown of it, and engage them as part of your uh, ongoing team to. Uh, to capture the synergies and effectuate the change from both uh, revenue as well as the cost savings projects perspective. Uh, that makes so much sense, Stephen. I mean, thinking about it is, you know, on paper, we can identify these are all the things that we want to do. Here's the plan. Here's the strategy. We've got it all figured out. But at the end of the day, there's still people involved and getting that management team on board, seeing the vision and understanding that can be really, I'm sure, quite critical to the change management that's going to be required to, to get that objective outcome. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that. So Jessica, as, as a representative inside of private, uh, private equity fund, what percentage of your investments are typically approached with a buy and build strategy through the add-on acquisition approach? Yeah, you know, it's, it's a great question. And I would say, Craig, that, you know, you, for us, I, I would say you really have to step back and think about how we approach our investments. Um, you know, I think some private equity firms have a very well-defined buy and build strategy and every deal they do, you know, they're going to, they're going to buy it with the intention to add on to it for, you know, very, to kind of achieve various, various goals. We really look at each deal um, as its own. So, so when we buy a business, we don't come in on day one or day a hundred with a list of 10 things to do and go knock them out. We really take, um, you know, sort of a, you know, slower intentional approach of, um, you know, sitting down with the management team, identifying what the sort of, you know, key growth levers are or should be, and then working together to achieve those. Um, you know, we find that, you know, as the buyer, if you come in thinking you're going to execute on an aggressive buy and build strategy, but your management team hasn't sort of bought into that approach, um, you know, it's going to be an uphill battle. Uh, so having said that, you know, I think at the end of the day, you know, just looking at the companies in our portfolio, looking at the companies in our platform and how we're approaching them, it's probably about half and half. Um, you know, I think sometimes, well, typically when, when we are looking at a deal, we try to identify what our operational agenda is, you know, really as, as early as we can, because we feel like that will help us define our, you know, our bid strategy and valuation and just, you know, how we approach the deal. And so um, I think, you know, it, if we can identify, um, you know, that, that we are investing or looking at a deal in a highly fragmented market where there are ample opportunities to go in and do add-ons, that's certainly gonna be exciting for us. We try to do some of that work ahead of time. You know, let's understand how many companies are out there in the size, size range we would be looking at um, and then, uh, and then go after them. But I'll tell you, we've also found, you know, we've gone into deals thinking that we were going to really put together, um, a platform with a series of add-ons. And as we've rolled our sleeves up and gotten sort of deeper into it, you know, decided, you know, actually this, this one is really one where we're going to focus on organic initiatives first and, and not kind of go, go chase other companies. So it really depends is the answer. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's one thing when you look through, um, the information memorandum, you do your diligence and you have your plan and then you do dig in and, and maybe identify, hey, there's some really meaningful organic opportunities here that we want to, you know, maybe rationalize into the business before we start looking at, you know, lumping on more additional um, organizations. Right. I mean, our view is that, you know, you, you have to make sure that you have the right pieces to the puzzle and that they all fit together. 
Um, and so slapping a bunch of companies together um, that really aren't sort of chasing a common goal, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah, no, that makes sense. <clears throat> so it's interesting because one of the themes that, or one of the messages we'll sometimes send to a client when I'm explaining you know, how we help and how we support in the process is by describing that uh, an organization or a fund is looking to come in and buy a company that's a $50 million in top line revenue, they want to grow it to $150 million in top line revenue. But, you know, it's first institutional capital and, you know, the company has kind of grown over the years and maybe it's being operated currently like you know, maybe it's a $25 million company. And so you've got to put in that scalability model to be able to accomplish those investment objectives. So, so I guess thinking about that, knowing that there's a foundational need in many cases, are there some other ways that you will treat a, this type of a platform where you're, you know, you're putting in a platform, building out a foundation and then wanting to do add-ons? Are there any insights that you can share, Jessica, where those are treated differently from other um, organizations or investments? So I think, um, I think systems and people are, are really what it comes down to. I think, you know, really making sure that you have the people in place to, um, to execute and integrate a deal. Um, and then, you know, having, for example, an ERP system in place that you can easily, um, you know, combine with others. Um, I think above all, it's really defining the strategy, um, you know, and understanding what, you know, what are the minimum integration requirements that we need to drive, you know, overall strategy of this business. Um, you know, I think sort of, you know, premature add-ons uh, can, can be, I mean, you know, they, they, they can, it's sort of, you know, one, one bad apple can spoil the bunch, right? And so I think, you know, Having a platform uh, with a solid foundation, but not a strategy on what you're going to do with it, um, is, uh, it is, is could be a disaster. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you so much for sharing, Jessica. Uh, Michael, did you want to share any thoughts with regards to um, how the platform approach with add-ons could look different from other acquisitions for related to, say, IT operations or other business aspects? Sure. Uh, when you talk about an IT and especially an operations uh, acquisition, a strategic acquisition or synergy, those are the highest value type of synergies. When you can consolidate operations uh, heavily, maybe eliminate GNA largely. So, uh, you know, combine factories, maybe add a shift to the acquirer's factory and eliminate the factory from a, an acquisition. So, Operational synergies are the highest value, so they're the most desirable, but they also have the most cost associated with them. So you need to account for the costs of synergies. You need to account for the cost of the integration plan, and it's going to take resources to, to execute on it. Um, so a lot of, a lot of you know, more detailed planning uh, and uh, Planning for costs and integration are, are all the more important when you get into those synergies. But they're also, with IT, for example, maybe CapEx savings. Uh, you're going to need to buy less equipment, less IT equipment, less production equipment. Uh, there may be savings in R&D as well if the companies are, are very closely matched. So these are all examples of individual synergies that need to be evaluated, assessed, quantified, and uh, if desired, uh, you know, realized and implemented. No, that makes a lot of sense. And it's something that I would say our team sees a lot um, on the IT side. And it, it comes down to the idea that, you know, organizations and, and talking with funds, I mean, in talking with funds, if they understand what some of that capital investment is going to be up front, they can prepare and plan for it. Um, you know, the name of the game, obviously, downstream is EBITDA, you know, it's going to be where can I grow top line, reduce my cost structure um, from an operating standpoint so that I can have a very strong, you know, earnings to use um, in the later stages of this ownership cycle. And so, you know, when we think about organizations that they're adding on and there's a bunch of different enterprise software solutions in place, well, every time there's a new ERP, from my experience, it's an entire set of 
you know, organizational structure required. You know, if you've got one company who's running an SAP at one location in their business, and then they've got another company that's running Epicor or Sage or, or Infor, you know, the people who are doing procurement, the people who are doing purchase uh, per, uh, sales, um, the organization that's managing that IT environment, you know, maybe even on through HR and, and different operating aspects, it requires a different competency set and the ability of rationalizing staff in that is a pretty big endeavor. And then of course you find yourself in a situation and Michael, you may have seen this in the past where you've got to do financial consolidation package implementations because it's all got to come together for, for flash reporting. So um, yeah, it's kind of fixing and, and right sizing the middle of the business from an operating cost standpoint by putting in tools and structure to, to stabilize and standardize. Good. Uh, Steven, Jessica, anything else that you wanted to add in relation to those thoughts? No, I think we covered it. Good. It seemed like we covered that one pretty strong. <laughs> Very good. So Michael, I'm gonna actually um, follow up with another question. What are some of the most significant challenges you've experienced by avoiding integration of add-on entities? Well, some of the, you mean the challenges of, of add-ons in general? Um, of not doing an integration of them. So let's say you've got, you know, a bunch of different individual entities that maybe you eventually want to pack up and sell as a, as a group, but they haven't been assimilated. So they're basically all um, yeah. operating their own environments. Yeah. So the, the challenges that you face doing an integration are, number one, management commitment to, to doing that. Uh, I hear from PE firms that the incumbent managers uh, uh, they've you know acquired as a platform uh, really have their hands full all of a sudden running a leveraged company which wasn't leveraged before the, the private equity firm acquired them. So, um, so you really need to have management commitment. You need to have staff. You need to have an integration plan that is detailed and documented uh, so that it can be managed and executed. Um, you know, sometimes there are cultural differences too that are challenges. Uh, and there have been some famous examples of that in the large, you know, PubCo areas. Uh, when uh, Hula Packard acquired Compaq Computers, you may recall that was oil and water. Same thing when AOL and Time Warner acquired Time Warner. It looked good on paper, but the cultures were so different, the companies never really were able to integrate and realize their synergies. So, you need to also take into account culture and uh, you know people, resources, integration planning. So lo lots to consider. Yeah, it sounds like we're kind of talking more like in that organizational change management piece. Uh, we do see a lot of times it comes back to you know internalizing it with the people. Um, so have you seen where the non-integrated model uh, affected the overall enterprise value when we were trying to sell? That group of entities, and is there any um, anecdotal information you can share related to that? You know, I, I would say uh, it could be viewed as a synergy for an acquirer, somebody who's going to go through the commitment to plan an integration and execute on it. It's, it's an opportunity if they if the uh, integration is possible but hasn't been done yet. Um, there are savings from not doing integrations. <laughs> uh, one thing about the cash flows for an integration when you plan the cost of an integration is it means that the costs are controllable. So for example, uh, in the context of a public company like, like Honeywell, if, if uh, we needed, uh, if cash was short, we were a little behind plan one quarter, we could postpone an integration intentionally, delay it in order to uh, realize some, some added benefits, let's say for the quarter. Um, so integrations are also also represent a controllable cost, but also a definable benefit that you may be deferring. So, okay, thank you. So, Stephen, out of curiosity, maybe get some perspective from you on what types of challenges you've seen in the past by not integrating add-ons. Yeah, I would think that the uh, just in general, I'm I'm a proponent of doing integrations. Just to set that straight from the beginning. Um, I think it's very important to get about that, to get get on with it, et cetera. Um, the 
only uh, the situations where not integrating, you know, can actually survive and 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 work well is when you're uh, you're acquiring businesses that are adjacencies, but not necessarily overlaps within a, a particular sector. So if you're uh, if you're addressing different marketplaces, uh, different geographies, uh, different technologies, but which are again complementary, yes, you can run those parallel, and then you're providing an overall package. But when you have the overlap uh, between what you've acquired and what you currently own, it's it's very important to bring them together. Um, and I think it's you know that's where you know uh, Michael just referred to as a potential opportunity for the next acquirer. Um, if you've if you've gone through the process of acquiring it in terms of just you know going from a platform to a, a platform with add-ons, uh, and you haven't done that, you 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 haven't created the value that you could could uh, realize. The thing I think you also have to think about just in general, I'm maybe a little bit off the uh, your particular question, but um, I think you have to really set the stage for thinking about um, first and foremost, deciding whether you wanna run a platform or wanna run a, 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 a growth opportunity through uh, external growth and acquisition. Once you've decided that, and again, this is important for both PE firms as well as more for PE firms, uh, a little less for family offices and obviously even less for strategics is you have to consider your holding period. So if you're uh, if you're investing within a fund and you've got a let's say a fund life of seven years and you're a couple of several years into your fund already when you've acquired a platform, um, do you have the the bandwidth and the and the uh, as well as the runway to get something done? If you don't, it's probably not a good idea to get started in that process because if you if you haven't completed the integration. And you're in the midst of it, the company is going to be a much, much more difficult to sell. Um, that being said, integrations, you know, the, the key is to define, as we talked about earlier, define your integration plan and tracking it, as particularly in coming up with your first 100 days uh, of what your execution is going to be. But in, in any event, getting, getting all of the integration efforts done within about a year and a half to two years, kind of uh, tail end. If you uh, extend beyond that, it becomes very difficult to track as well as get it done. So, very good. Thank you so much, Stephen. So, Jessica, I'm going to actually. Oh, you came off mute, so you're probably ready for me to ask you a question, aren't you? <laughs> well, I, I was. I was going to. I was going to just, you know, add on to it. Stephen, yes. But, uh, but no, go for go for your question. Well, actually, we're 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 completely aligned. I'll 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 tailor the question slightly, but I think that was my goal is to have you add on a little bit just because of your experience inside the fund. And I really wanted to just get back to, have you seen where that um, model of not integrating these add-ons has had an impact on the value um, when you went to sell or, um, or that you foresee? Sure. So um, I would say, so a few things. What I was going to say, um, just sort of responding to, to, what, to what Stephen and Michael said was, I think, you know, integration really needs to make the organization more effective, more efficient, and ultimately more profitable. And that should really be the filter for integration all the time. Um, you know, don't integrate just for integration's sake. Like there has to be a reason, there has to be a strategic objective. Um, for example, if you have a platform that sells products through a dealer network and you are acquiring a company that sells products directly, it might not make sense to slap those sales forces together and sort of pick one channel or the other, right? It, it probably makes sense to say, well, we can approach more of the market if you do it your way and I do it my way, but we find a way to sell a broader product suite across both channels, right? Um, similarly, right, if the products are very different, but you know, maybe there's the same end market, it might not make sense to slap product development together if at the end of the day, the products are, are you know, pretty different. So I think you really need to focus on what the strategy is that brought them together. Um, and then you know, sort of back to your question on does it affect value? Um, so I think absolutely yes. You know, I think at the end of the day, and for us as a buyer, if we're looking at a company that's, you know, bolted together five companies, but they're not really all that integrated and you're just, you know, adding a bunch of numbers together and saying, you know, look, look what EBITDA is because we, you know, bought this business and added five other businesses. 
you know, that means we got to do the work. That's okay. We, we can do the work and we can work through an integration plan, but we're probably not going to pay up and do the work. Um, you know, and then I would say just on the flip side of that, when you find an add-on that makes sense, do the integration um, properly, see it in the numbers, um, you know, there's, there's absolutely value for that. I mean, a great example um, is uh, a former platform of ours, Edsco. Uh, they make um, anchor support solutions that go into infrastructure and markets. They were outsourcing a certain part of their manufacturing process. They were able to do an add-on of a company that made similar products, but they happened to insource this particular process. We were able to roll out that process across Edsco's other facilities, meaningfully improve margins while also growing the, growing the top line. And so it was a win-win. Now, had we bought the business and said, hey, next buyer, you can do this, you know, for them, that's a lot more risk because what if it doesn't work, right? Um, so when you put in the when you put in the work and you have a strategy, it will absolutely pay off from a valuation perspective. Um, similar story with Eckhart, one of our portfolio companies. Um, we have done Eckhart makes um, so basically you know it's automation solutions tools and then you know integrating their tools into an assembly line. And um, we bought the business. They were very concentrated in automotive. They had you know some some customer concentration within the end market concentration, but really great products. And so, you know, we went into that deal saying, okay, you know, if we can acquire companies that serve different end markets, that serve different customers, that potentially, you know, we can expand our footprint, we can expand our service offerings, um, you know, and, and really sort of put that package together, you know, that, that, that will bring value. And, um, and that's, you know, that, that's kind of where we are today. We've done, we've done six deals. We have grown into new geographies. We've grown into new men, end markets. We've grown into new customers. We've picked up new product solutions along the way, um, you know, and integrated, you know, sort of from a, from a back office finance ERP system perspective. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much for sharing that, Jessica. Yeah. So uh, a couple of things come to mind as I was listening um, to the overview, and I think this is, it really helped me think about the impact that um, different aspects of the business will have impact. I think you made a great point that, okay, if you're manufacturing, you know, widgets in this company and this other one is a distributor of sorts and they have different types of sales teams and whatnot, it doesn't always say that we have to go into a full integration or a fully assimilated model. Some of the areas that I think can be really impactful and, um, I would warn to probably consider somewhat of a fully integrated or fully assimilated model is some aspects of IT and cybersecurity. If you've got different types of cyber platforms or management, the exposures increase probably quite a bit on the business. If you know, you've got this $300 million combined set of entities and a $50 million add-on had a breach because it really doesn't have a cybersecurity answer, uh, that could be really a meaningful impact to the overall co combined entity group. Uh, much the same with, with just fundamental infrastructure and security connecting the different business units together. If they're a hodgepodge of uh, technology equipment, that could really open up some exposures, but also um, some inconsistencies and problems that could come from that. Not to mention that you've got maybe IT staff or service providers spattered throughout the continent, you know, without any kind of real connectivity. So those are just some of the things I guess uh, my team has seen firsthand that, that can really be an impact, even if, you know, we're maintaining multiple ERPs because that's, you know, the reality that we're facing as, as a platform. So um, moving to another question, I'm going to start with you, Stephen, if I can. What are some lessons learned that you can share when integrating add-on acquisitions and how have you leveraged external service providers in that process? Good. So uh, I think we touched upon this a little bit, but the lessons learned is really is, is the upfront planning. You have to uh, have it mapped out before you get started, before you complete the acquisition. And as I mentioned, the importance of bringing the, bringing the new teammates and to, uh, leadership team into the process uh, after you've completed the acquisition is essential. Um, the, uh, the impact of uh, 
and the use of uh, external uh, service providers, third parties, advisors, whether they be, uh, you know, in groups like yourselves or, uh, or even investment banks or financial advisors like ourselves, um, it's, it's very important to kind of reach out to those uh, trusted advisors that you have in order to, to assimilate and, and get this moved along. Um, you most times don't have all the expertise in-house and, uh, and leveraging the, by providing that, uh, that extra bandwidth is pretty important. Um, the, uh, I mentioned tracking, very important to, uh, to keep track of not only what the project is, how it's going, what the, whether it's a revenue synergy or a cost synergy, you know, what your, your stage gate, I've used that uh, before in terms of, uh, what you need to accomplish at which point so that make sure you stay on track and you don't end up at the end of the process and say, you know, how did that all get together? Um, I will also emphasize, you know, sort of lessons learned as well. Um, if you are going to go about doing this on a multiple stage effort to take a platform and add multiple uh, add-ons, the, uh, the most important thing you can do is on the first acquisition, when you complete the integration, is document everything. Uh, because then you can go about and replicate that for acquisition number two, three, four, five, whichever it may be, uh, without reinventing the wheel. And uh, oftentimes people get, get ahead of themselves. They just get the work done, uh, look back and say, okay, we got it done. And you've missed a great opportunity to, uh, to plan for the future at that point. Oh, that's some great insight, Stephen. It, it makes me think about something that um, we really encourage clients to do when they're in this, um, in this model of doing M&A acquisition add-ons. And that's going to be um, something we call an M&A playbook. You know, and the idea of saying, hey, what I need you to do is that we need to sit down and identify how are we going to handle acquisitions? Because it doesn't mean that you know, everyone looks the same. I mean, I think Jessica pointed that out really well. There's going to be some areas where it's like, you know, we want to centralize purchasing in this specific platform, as an example, we want to centralize purchasing and HR and IT, but we want to have a distributed sales force. And we actually want to have, maybe we want to maintain um, a certain group of plants, like this is one that works in certain industries because of um, compliance and, and um, different regulatory aspects there, while these other ones have different competencies. And so understanding kind of that vision and laying out a bit of a charter related to that where it's identifying, okay, in the different areas, here's who owns, you know, a bit of a racy chart. Are you guys pretty familiar with racy charts? So who's responsible, uh, you know, who's accountable, who's contributing and who's informed in this process? Like, let's get a plan together in advance and blueprint what we want to do here and how we're going to do it before we start executing on that. So Stephen, it just triggered what you were sharing, kind of that yeah. thought. I would, I guess I could add to that. Actually, as you were speaking, I was writing down my notes of what else to add to uh, the conversation here. Um, you brought up a racy chart, which is the next point I was going to make is, you know, de defining who's on the team and who has which responsibilities is extremely important. And having an overall project lead that's responsible for everything that goes on with the integration and what we call uh, single points of accountability with people whose names are you know, on each particular item. So people can look to uh, that person for, for, the pro for that uh, progress report out and they're effectively, they own it is extremely important. So uh, I'm glad you brought that up. Go ahead, Michael. I, I just thought I'd add one more tool that sophisticated acquirers use and that is checklists. Uh, we had a hundred day checklist. And so for example, you know, item one on day one is change the bank accounts who can sign checks, you know, for example, and it goes on from there. So no, that, that's, it, it, you know, it's funny. We use this word. It's, it's essentially governance, right? How are we going to govern this plan? And, you know, Stephen, you're referencing uh, what I would call a core team and a governance structure of people. Maybe there's an executive board that obviously is going to be reported to. And if there's some deviations that we'd suggest from the plan, because we have a different kind of acquisition, we have a way that we review those decisions to make sure that they are not deviating too far from that plan. And then of course, Michael, it's the idea of, you know, what are the tools that we're going to use in doing this so that we can avoid missteps? It, 
it's one of those ideas of kind of fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me, right? If we get ahead of it up in the advance, then we don't have to make the same mistakes repeatedly. Jessica, I'm going to let you kind of wrap up a thought on this matter of just maybe some lessons learned. And I do see a question came in, so I'm going to go ahead and see what's going on there. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. First of all, completely echo all the comments about just make a plan. Who's going to do what? I mean, I, I remember when one of our portfolio companies did an add on a simple chart that was, you know, it was a list of jobs and was it the platform or the add on, you know, sort of which, you know, you're, you're ultimately going to merge all these functions, but who's sort of the lead on each one? Um, overly simple, but it, it got the job done. Um, you know, in terms of lessons learned, I think number one, have the strategy, lay out the strategy. Number two, make sure the right people are in the right seats to execute on that strategy. Um, you know, if you are acquiring a business that you know, has a lot of complexities in the numbers, make sure you have a good CFO, you know, in that chair, uh, or that you, you know, hire someone like Clint Moran to, uh, to work with you through the process. So I just think, um, you know, it all comes down to, uh, to people and either, either having the right people in the right seats internally, or in some cases, you know, hiring third parties, which we've talked about a little bit. Thank you so much, Jessica. And just, I guess, uh, a quick shout out from the standpoint, Platt Moran's not just financial. <laughs> we are full services. So, uh, you know, we do a lot of work in operational M&A as well. But of course, financial is um, a, an amazing part of our heritage too. Thank you so much for that. So Ron, Ronald had asked if you get a copy of the checklist, Michael. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was the question that had come in. And so as I think about that, you know, when I think about the different um, M&A task lists that we uh, work through with clients, we'll start with like this huge kind of list, but then we want to boil it down to something that makes more sense specific to the organization because it can look different for um, so many different kinds of companies that I'm not sure how a generic one starts out, but may maybe Michael, if you want to share some perspectives there. And you're on mute. Yeah, thanks. Uh, well, well I, I agree with you, Craig. They're they're customized to the situation. You know, there are some, you know, kind of general uh, things you would always do. Um, yeah, let's. Uh, you know, Craig is really the best source. I mean, you're doing this the integrations day in day out, so. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm you'd really be the, the contact for that. Yeah, yeah, what I could do, Ronald, is I'd be happy to make contact with you, understand your situation a little better, uh, just to probably most specifically address what you're looking for. Because, you know, when I think about a $20 million, you know, food processor, that list is gonna look probably quite different than, you know, a $200 million uh, clutch manufacturer who, you know, is owned um, internationally, you know, so it does vary quite a bit, but Ronald, I will follow up with you after this session to, to go ahead and um, talk more specifically. So I think that's all we have from a questions perspective. I guess we have a few minutes left and I wanted to open the floor as we've been talking through a lot of things with M&A today. Um, it would be great to hear some more perspectives if anybody wanted to share some thoughts around add-ons. Um, I know Jessica, you said you guys are working through some directly right now. And, and I know Michael, you and Steven have done some rather large strategic uh, M&A work. Uh, any other perspectives that would make good sense? Yeah, you, you know, I'll offer a few um, observations about strategic buyers. Um, number Number one is, they plan to acquire. It's part of their strategic growth plan. Um, literally, I'll give you some statistics. At a large company, if you're if you're in a company, let's say where the market's growing five percent a year, but your commitment to shareholders is to grow ten or twelve percent a year to, to Wall Street or your LPs or your shareholders, that's double the industry growth rate. And if you're already a large player, I mean, how do you do that? The, the way you do that is with strategic acquisitions. That's that's the role. And I can tell you literally at large strategic buyers, it's baked, M&A is baked into the strategic plan. Um, and I can tell you statistically, it, we used M&A to double our revenue and income growth rates. 
you know, above the industry growth rates. Um, uh, so, and the bang for the buck is very high. So, uh, you know, a large strategic company might have 20,000 people working on organic growth, whereas the M&A group might be 40 people producing an equal amount of revenue and income growth. Uh, so it gives you an idea where the bang for the buck. Corporate M&A is very high value. It's the fastest way, in my experience, to create value, both short term, and it, you know, short term instant value comes from multiples expansion and scale expansion. I mean, that literally happens on day one, just for signing the papers. And then over, as you mentioned, a year or two, executing on an integration plan, we'll realize the synergy values, which mm -hmm. can be substantial, you know, typically can, can increase value 50% uh, of enterprise value if for a high value consolidation synergy, for example. So, yeah. yeah. One of the things that really comes to mind is when I think about, you know, big deviation from strategic buyers to like private equity, first institutional capital type of organizations in the middle market is how they're structured. You know, I think in the institutional side, you can start a career, work your way into the M&A um, segment of the company and say, this is my career plan is helping with, you know, strategic M&A for this larger enterprise. Um, I have yet to go into a middle market, you know, 50, 100, 150 million dollar manufacturer where the people are like, finally, we're going to get into my M&A career plan. Uh, it's not what I would say we typically see. Uh, in general terms, um, what I've seen in middle market manufacturing, at least, has been organizations that have, you know, they have Johnny on the floor, who is the scheduler and planner for, for production. And we have you know, Gina in purchasing and she helps negotiate and replenish materials and, and take care of all that. And we go through the entire organization and find out that it wasn't anybody who came in and said my career plan was M&A. And when we start introducing maybe some of the shock and awe that tends to come with that a little bit, um, there's a real need for helping people internalize and digest that. And so that's one of the biggest red flags that I've probably seen raised. Um, in the M&A space is saying, you know, the good news is we've got staff, we'll just kind of add on the companies and we'll figure it out along the way. It could be a long, strenuous practice um, to do things. And, and so I think what we'll sometimes advise is if you're building a company model around a certain activity, staffing that activity makes good sense. If you're saying I'm using it for some other aspect and it's more of a temporary model, um, it's usually a lot wiser to just make the investment in that short term, get the capital aspects out of the way so that you can really accomplish the business objectives without absolutely disrupting the career plans and activities of the people who are trying to move through the day to day. That, that makes a ton of sense. That makes a ton of sense. And I think, I mean, it's, I think it's why though that the, the, the private equity model has worked because this, the person who is sort of lacking in that middle market or lower middle market manufacturing company, mm -hmm. um, that role can be played by the private equity firm, right? Either the operating partner or even the associate of the private equity firm in some cases, someone who's sort of helping to connect the dots between, um, you know, whether it's the financials or whether it's, you know, something even on the integration management side. Great. Thank you. Yeah, Steve. Greg, to add, add to that, yeah, um, I know Michael referred to a large uh, corporates having uh, big uh, M and A groups, et cetera. You're, you're correct that at smaller organizations, there's not going to be that uh, that wide span um, support. Uh, so the importance for organizations that uh, you know, whether they be private equity owned, family office owned, or even smaller strategics, is in fact to uh, on your first uh, first entree is is to rely upon outside advisors and third party resources. And if you determine that that's a success, then, you know, then bring in the staff and, and staff it internally, because it's certainly going to be, you know, obviously a lot cheaper to do it yourself if you're able to do it. Uh, I will, from the, the advisor standpoint, I'll tell you, there, there are a lot of places you will trip up and which in, in the end will cost you more. Um, so it's, there, there's no really cheap route about going about doing it. But, um, but by having the dedicated uh, people, whether that's uh, people you're typically, as you said, people aren't going to grow up and, you know, in the organization and say, this is what they want to do. Um, that's really top down, 
top down led from uh, either the existing uh, management who is, uh, has been given that mandate by the new owners or from uh, people just looking to uh, continually grow their business. Great, thank you, Stephen. So I think that really concludes uh, some of the things that we wanted to talk to today. I guess uh, as, a, as a final thought, I wanna really take an opportunity to say, first of all, thank you so much to Jessica Ginsburg, uh, Michael Cohen and Steven Zelak for, for joining me in this discussion today. I'm really hopeful that the audience uh, participants were able to get some tidbits out of this discussion that'll be helpful for you. Um, I will volunteer on behalf of myself, but I guess I can volunteer on behalf of uh, the panelists and you guys can tell me if I'm wrong, but obviously we're very happy to continue the conversation individually. Every situation's different, um, every client's different. And so understanding a little bit more at a personal level is, is a great way for us to further networking and working together um, on some of these discussions. So. Thank you to the panel. Thank you, Lena, for all your work in, in pulling, um, organizing this group, and I'll let you wrap up. Yes, thank you so much, Craig, and to all of our panelists as well. Uh, we really appreciate your contributions to this discussion. We hope all of you in the audience found value. I'm sure that any of our panelists would be happy to follow up with anyone that has questions. So if you need their contact information, please feel free to reach out to me directly. Uh, we have a number of events coming up, but on the more recent or uh, soon to come events would be July 15th in two days, our fireside chat with Mark Geller of Happy Returns. He just sold his company to PayPal for a nice uh, sum. So please tune in for that. For those of you who are participating in our Deal Connect meetings, you're going to want to log out of this link and log into the separate link that my colleagues circulated yesterday. But again, thank you to our panelists, to our attendees, and of course, our sponsors for your continued support. Uh, it was nice to have everyone here today, and we look forward to seeing you all soon, hopefully in person. Take care, everyone. <laughs>